Hello, today I'm speaking with Professor Lillian Wanri and Dr. Sarah Javanparast from College of Medicine and Public Health at Flinders University. Welcome. Thank you very much, Melissa. It's great to speak with you today. Um, so the paper that uh, has just been published is titled Health Service Access and Utilisation Amongst Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Populations in Regional South Australia, a Qualitative Study. And um, I'm really thrilled to be talking with you about this today. I wonder if we could first start with talking about who are the members of the research team. Yeah, if I can, if I can kick up, uh, this was a, a three a three member team, which was um, led by myself, and Sarah was the person who was really operational in terms of collecting the data and the doing uh, all stuff regarding to the um, the research. And also we had um, Kashif Navik, who, Nakif, which, who was working for the Country SA Primary Health Network. And Kashif was very instrumental in terms of organizing all the procedures and processes and organizing people in the, um, the research setting, which was very instrumental in terms of the smoothness of operation of the research. So it included Sarah as the primary author, um, Kashif as the operational person who helped us, and myself as a lead team member. So the three team members were those ones. Terrific. So how did the study come about? Yeah, the study came about as a felt need by the country SCA Primary Health Network. They had seen that there were really poor access of services by the culturally and linguistically diverse populations in the region. And therefore, it was really amazing how come that they, they are, there was an increasing number of cultural and linguistic population because the Australian policy has been shifted and people are being resettled in the country. But over time, the, the, the increase of population settling there was not proportional to people who were coming to access services. So the country SCA um, primary health care commissioned us to see whether we can explore and see what were the factors which hindered access. And if there were, then what would be the solutions or recommendations for improvement in the services as well as the policies. Hmm. And what were the main findings of the study? Um, uh, thank you, Melissa, for this opportunity. That's great. I think that was a really interesting experience um, uh, working with uh, many health services, health providers, and I guess uh, in particular engaging with the cold uh, communities, uh, people from different ethnic groups in uh, three different regions for this study uh, who took part in, in, in our project. Um, I think the main thing, because what we did, we both um, talk to health providers in the regions as well as the community members, a, a, a wide range of uh, uh, people living in, in, in rural and remote areas. A couple of key findings from our study, one was the issues around health literacy. So from both health providers and community members, uh, <clears throat> that was a key issue in terms of navigating the health system, the complexities around that, especially for those who are newly arrivals and they don't know how to find information, how to get access to different services, and especially the, the cultural backgrounds and the their understanding of the health system and where to seek uh, um, care when they need it. So that was the main issue. And the second key issue, um, um, which uh, I think it actually our study confirmed previous studies around uh, health service access was around communication and language, which despite all the um, um, different strategies and services and facilities like interpreting services, we found that in rural and remote areas that might be a, an issue and a problem and challenge for many people to access interpreting services and still there are rooms for improvement around that. The access, 
access and availability of health services at different levels from GPs, which is the, the core in providing primary health services to specialist care to a light health services. That was an issue which was related to um, to the location and transport. And in many uh, examples, we found that it's not just for this target population, but it's more related to the area and the location uh, which people had problem in access to basic health services and primary health services. Um, the um, um, culturally appropriateness of the services and um, especially for health providers, access to cultural training services was an issue uh, that uh, we also found in this study. And finally, what we found was that apart from specific health services, um, um, the, the policies, the research, and uh, what we, when we are working with this target population, especially in rural and remote areas, it's important to consider the broader determinants of their health. It could be transport, it could be housing, which was a major challenge for many community members that we talked, um, which uh, without um, uh, taking these factors and these determinants into consideration, it's, it would be hard to address um, uh, the issues that they've got in terms of healthcare and social care in re uh, remote and rural areas. Um, the findings of your study are really fascinating. Um, so what actually needs to come next to improve access and reduce inequity for this population? Yes, uh, that's a really interesting question, Melissa, because these findings call for a lot of actions. Firstly, to improve migrant support services to facilitate health system navigation. As we found in this um, study, the services may be there, but it's very hard for migrants and the, uh, refugees to navigate them. So services which will support them, for example, um, not necessarily health services, other services which can help them to know what is available, where are they, and also to understand cultural and the language barriers which face all populations in rural settings would be very important. This role is very critical because then if we have this um, supporting services, then these migrants can access services at the right time and the right place. Secondly, we need to address some of the barriers which Sarah mentioned, particularly with the communication barrier. So in improving this, we need to improve the interpreting services, including in personal and the, um, also the telecommunication strategy. And uh, even though these are available, but they are not adequate at the moment, so we need to improve that. We also need to improve the bilingual health information widely to improve and uh, um, align with the populations which are available there because cultural and linguistic diverse population is a very um, diverse population and therefore no one size fits all. Another thing would be to improve the cultural appropriateness of the services as we saw that there are services but then the, the service providers are not necessarily cultural competent. So we we'll need to provide um, courses or develop developmental programs that will help the service providers to know this population. That would be maybe similar to Aboriginal and the Torrent Strait Islander people's programs which are available, but then expanding that to improve the core population. This way will improve the health professional's capacity to acknowledge and also to, under, to understand the cultural diversity of these um, populations. And we may need also to recruit the um, retained health professionals who reflect the cultural diversity because these populations, they want to see people who look like them, who talk like them. And particularly for women, um, specifically the the um, obviously and gynecologists uh, should be women so that they can um, cater for the needs of these women, particularly for a participant was a Muslim, they were more likely to access the services if the services were provided by the, the woman rather than a, a, a man. Another thing which is really important is to invest in disease prevention and health promotion interventions. 
we found that the, these services are not widely available. So these services, including um, health promotion strategies, which will be tailored to poor population in the region areas, is very important in order for them to um, improve the knowledge, understanding, and also to decrease or reduce the, um, the need to go to acute care because people, they take health, um, they take care of their own health and therefore not necessarily need the health care. Or if they need the health, care, they could just go to the GP instead of going straight to the hospital. So I think the, the next thing which is really important is about the um, providing advocacy for supporting migrant policies and funding. So in Australia today, you find that there is no much advocacy in terms of improving policies for improving migrants and coach and the um, refugee health. So system level policies that will support the diversity of services are very important, as well as improving the regulatory environment within the healthcare system. So we needed to improve advocacy in terms of improving the services. Uh, this could be um, broader migration services, and it could be broader funding models which will enable regional organizations and the services to provide accessible and affordable services and also to provide really funding and policies that support research in this area. This area is very under-researched and is still very under-resourced. So really important to have funding models which specifically target this population in order for us to know more about this because the population is increasing, the diversity of population is increasing, and also the settlement in the rural area is very required in order to boost population in those areas and to enable the population which is settled there to settle in a healthy way in order to have really benefits for now and for the future. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing your future research. Thank you, Melissa.